Well, thanks for uh, for joining with us today, um, and allowing us from the ABR to present this update. Um, you know, we met two months ago. A lot has happened in the meantime. We've been working every day on this, and uh, um, we're making some slow progress. And, and it's slow actually by design. Um, and I'll, I'll allude to that uh, in a few minutes. I, ha I have about eight slides or so. So this is not very long because I want to make sure there's um, a, a lot of time for questions and discussion when we're done. Um, but I do want to cover a couple of things that really revolve around the parameters and what we're considering as we design the exam model. Uh, first, we want it to be secure. And, uh, and we acknowledge that that uh, really addresses content risk, that is individuals who might share the content and, and give an unfair advantage to other individuals. And also in sharing content, it makes it harder for us to develop uh, a good exam year after year. Um, so the idea is the content is supposed to be secure. The environment itself will, in the new environment uh, of the remote exam, be largely up to the individual. And uh, we'll have to meet certain requirements. Uh, mostly we'll have to make sure that there are not um, resources available that would make this an open book test, because as you know, of course, it's not an open book test. Uh, we're trying to test knowledge, and as a result, we uh, need to make sure that people aren't using colleagues to help them or uh, web searches or textbooks, et cetera. We acknowledge that there's going to be a difficulty with cultural accept of what I would call politely intrusive remote proctoring. And, and this really just uh, addresses the fact that when you're taking an exam, as colleges and universities have dealt with for years in, in an online testing environment, when you're taking an exam remotely, you have a webcam that's observing you. Uh, you have to go through security checks at the outset to show that you're working in a an environment that doesn't have a crowded desktop with uh, with books and resources and, and other materials, and of course they only have one device. So um, part of the problem with that is that uh, you know I'm being polite when I say intrusive. Uh, it actually borders on offensive sometimes to some people who really could take this as well. You think I'm going to cheat, therefore you have these uh, these sort of barriers in place. And and our attitude really is that we want to treat professionals as professionals uh, and. And we have to be careful in the way we communicate this because we want to make sure people understand that we know that the vast majority of individuals taking our exams didn't get to where they are uh, by circumventing procedures and, and policies and, and acting unethically. They they got to where they are because they are professionals that they and they behave in that way. Um, but that said, we all know that there are people who, uh, given the right opportunity, might try to circumvent the process in a high stakes environment. I mean, they have a lot riding on this. They're, they're tense. They're anxious. They're stressed out. And and uh, we want to make sure that we don't make those opportunities too obvious, so that people play by the rules and and that uh, and that the test is valid, as I'll mention in a moment. So so we're we're aware that uh, there are going to be some some difficulties with some people accepting this model. And, and the key for us, at least, is to make sure we've communicated in advance why we're doing it that way and what those security measures would entail. And it's going to be very similar to what has happened millions of times in colleges and universities uh, in administering remote exams. We haven't decided yet on which method of remote proctoring we're going to use. Uh, there are two sort of basic flavors, a live proctor, which involves an individual actually watching um, actually, a series of, of people who are taking the test at the same time, um, or do you use artificial intelligence? The, the downside of the latter really is that it's more a retrospective tool, the way it's usually applied, and it's used to check after you're done your organic chemistry final, for example, to make sure that you didn't you know, uh, use your phone to look up an answer or get help from a colleague, et cetera, um, or, or leave the exam environment and, and go off and, and check. Um, sources and, and then come back and resume the test, that kind of thing. Um, so what we're looking at right now is most likely going to be a hybrid of a live proctored environment and the use of artificial intelligence uh, as a as a tool to make both work effectively. And uh, some of the vendors offer this hybrid. Uh, some would argue for one over the other. But again, we're still working through what that would represent and, and one versus the other. The uh, Second exam parameter is that it has to be fair and consistent. As I said earlier, the, the candidate's gonna control the environment for the most part, but it needs to be a space free of noise and interruption. 
the exam has to be practical in terms of cost. It has to be reliable and it has to be simple in its execution. And that would refer both to the IT platform and the interface that the candidate has to interact with. Because if it's too complicated, that becomes a distraction. It becomes something we're really not trying to test. We're trying to test knowledge, not someone's ability to adjust to a new platform they haven't seen before. And we'll have ways to mitigate that uh, that I'll talk about in a couple of slides. It has to be error free or nearly error free. This is a high stakes environment. Uh, we would acknowledge that this needs to be something that we're confident that every candidate will have a reasonable experience with. And, and that means that, uh, that they're not gonna have difficulties because of something we didn't design correctly or execute correctly. Um, and, and we acknowledge that this is not as simple as, uh, for example, releasing teaching modules or something where if it doesn't work, you just say, okay, I'll log in tomorrow or, um, or I'll, I'll check back next week or, or whatever it might be. In this case, we acknowledge this is a high stakes environment and it's in some ways it's one shot because as, as we said earlier, if we have content, um, we, once that's released, we'd have to basically write another test in order to administer it a second time. So we're acknowledging this is uh, it's stressful for us because we have expected of ourselves that we're gonna execute at very close to 100%. We're trying to optimize the candidate experience. And this is something that's not new to us philosophically, but it has been our sort of go-to uh, as we've discussed uh, internally at the ABR, what we're gonna do next, uh, what, what are we gonna design? Uh, how are we gonna uh, make some decisions about what the model is gonna look like and, and really when in doubt, we're coming back to this, we're coming back to how do we make sure that the candidate experience is optimized? Are, is it flexible uh, in terms of the computer-based exams? Do we have, we have breaks during the exam day? Um, do we have uh, before connection disruptions? Are we accommodating for individuals with disabilities or for nursing mothers? Um, you know, these kinds of things that actually represent opportunities in many ways, um, uh, but at the same time, of course, we have different obstacles and, and, and different challenges, uh, specifically the, the IT connection, but can we recover from that in that we didn't require that the individual travel to take uh, the exam um, in 2021? And, and lastly, and, and perhaps uh, it, this is sort of a tie with optimization of the candidate experience, we, we need this to be a valid process. And, and I say we, not just the ABR, uh, the candidate needs for this to be a valid process. And if it's not secure, and if it's not consistent across different test takers, and if it's not error free, I mean, these are the kinds of things that would make it a problem to, to call it a valid credential. And, uh, and in this context, what we mean is that it really has to recognize that the individual went through a lot of training. It re represents a significant achievement and an accomplishment for these people who are sitting for the exam. And, and we wanna make sure at the end of the day that that's what it represents, that this in fact, validates and, and is credible to the public in terms of what it means uh, in serving patients in the future. And we get this question a lot, so I include a specific slide about the American Board of Surgery exam uh, because it was such a public failure in July. And, uh, and I listened to, uh, I guess, a, a total of three hour, no, closer to four or five hours of, of their webinars as they tried to explain uh, what happened to their constituents, to their candidates for their certification exam. And, um, and the short answer was that they admitted that they rushed the design and implementation because they decided in April to execute an exam in July. And that's just too short an interval to make sure that you had had the time to test uh, at the QA, the, the IT interface to make sure that, um, that anything that could go wrong had already been anticipated. And that just isn't enough time to uh, design uh, an exam in that way. And, uh, and they admitted that was probably the, the single biggest failing. Now they had another problem that was the security of personal information. And, and what we learned from this, and, and I'm really sorry this happened to surgery, but the, the good news for the other boards, not just radiology, but any board contemplating a remote exam is we can look to that and say, okay, let's not do some of the things that they did in order to avoid the same pitfalls that they were unfortunate enough to, to have to live through. And, um, and, and what we're doing, of course, is we dismiss that vendor that, that they used and just uh, we're not even gonna consider them because they failed in a big way that had ramifications across individuals and, and at least the perception and probably at least partly the reality that uh, personal information had been shared. And, uh, and of course the exam itself did not work. 
Uh, but beyond that, you know, we set a timeline out in front of us that stretches into the first quarter of next year, still very aggressive. And, uh, and we feel that given a choice, I would have said, let's take 24 months to get this done. Uh, realistically, we couldn't do that for the candidates. That's uh, really too prolonged a timeline. Uh, but at the same time, this is about as quickly as we could possibly do it. And although we're confident we can do it, uh, this is a big lift. It's got a lot of moving parts. It seems simple at the outset, uh, but uh, we're being very careful. And, and I just hope we're being careful enough because this is a, a very complicated process to try to piece together. Um, we're going to be using pilot exams uh, and for the computer based exams, those will be uh, given to the diagnostic radiology certifying group. And the reason for that is that is a, a, a truncated exam for people who are well beyond training, uh, but it's still a computer based exam because, of course, diagnostic radiology doesn't have oral exams anymore. And we're hoping that this group will basically pilot the software uh, the, uh, and the interface. So these security uh, measures that we're going to have to have in place. Um, so the hope is that we can do that in January, our first uh, sort of live administration, if you will, although the pilot exam technically is live, just on a small scale, our first live administration is the diagnostic radiology core exam in February. And as you know, the physics qualifying exams uh, are planned for April. Uh, so the, the pilot will follow actually internal beta testing and, and a dry run that would include uh, other endeavors to make sure that we've kind of mapped this out. And for the oral exams, we'll be doing the same thing. The pilot exams for the oral exams will in, uh, in the second half of March. We don't have the exact dates, but we'll be inviting people to participate. Historically, we've actually had uh, people oversubscribe to this. Um, we know that when we offer up a pilot, and, and the deal is, it works like this. If you if you take the pilot and you fail, it doesn't count against you. It's as if it never happened. If you take the pilot and you pass, well, you're board certified, provided, of course, you've met all the other requirements, but you've satisfied the exam uh, facet of this. And uh, so we anticipate that we'll have more interest in the pilot uh, exams than we have capacity. But at the same time, we want to test this out with a small number of people so that we can intervene uh, effectively and you know, discover well, what are the unknowns that we didn't anticipate? What are the considerations that we didn't think about in advance? Uh, we also want to have prep sessions, and this relates more to the um, computer-based exam, but also for the oral exam. And that really is this ability to kind of log in in advance, test out your your device, your laptop or um, or a desktop computer, to make sure, yeah, I can log in. I I know how to navigate the basics of the system, and I'm comfortable that on exam day, I want to be challenged to figure out, you know, what in the world's going on. And, and we're going to communicate this well in advance of the exam so people can be reassured. Yeah, test out your network, test out your device, uh, have some practice questions for the computer-based exams, and at least the ability to confirm uh, for the oral exam that you can actually log in and, and uh, get to that um, sort of registration uh, screen. Uh, and, and these prep sessions would allow the candidates to test out their technology, to look at security measures, and, and as I say, practice sessions. And for the computer-based exams, we expect them to be unlimited. As you might anticipate for the oral exams, we really can't do that because the examiner is not present for that. But for, for the qualifying exams uh, for physics, uh, basically multiple tries to kind of say, yeah, I, I know it. I can log in. I know what pieces I'm going to have to do on exam day, and, and I'm comfortable about that. So we can take as much mystery out of this in advance so the candidates feel comfortable in the days and weeks leading up to the exam itself. Uh, we shared this in July, the idea that the certifying uh, oral exam is a combination of commercially available video conferencing, either WebEx, Zoom, Teams, whatever it might be. Um, we haven't decided on the vendor yet. It's, uh, I shouldn't say it's not important, but it's something that we feel comfortable that we can get uh, uh, modified very slightly to make sure it works for us, for the ABR and for the exam and for the candidate. But then in addition, number two here is the, the fact that we have to develop the exam platform. We've had a little point from the trustees looking at what it's going to look like from the candidate's perspective, what it's going to look like from the examiner's perspective. And these are important features, obviously, in developing a replacement for the in-person oral exam. <laughs> Excuse me. We also have a navigator function. This is a person uh, who's assigned one-on-one -on -one to a candidate. And uh, their intent, uh, the design is really to have them assist uh, the examiner and the candidate, it, it assists the candidate really in that coordination so that the examiners are queued up, ready to go. 
um, the candidate is merely passed from one examiner to the next, and it's seamless for the candidate because they're sitting there with the navigator there to make sure that, okay, if your next exam starts in six minutes, and we're gonna go ahead and, and link you up and make sure that that connection is established. Um, and then any questions about IT, et cetera, this is all what the navigator does on the day of the exam. And as I said, that navigator sits with the candidate from start to uh, during the exam itself. We're gonna have two simultaneous examiners. This redundancy is important based on data that we have uh, admittedly somewhat um, haphazard in the way it was collected, but other exams have talked about from other boards, not exactly parallel to this, but similar in that they're remote exams based on the internet. They've talked about 10% fail rates. Now, the good news is that at least some of those failures are, they couldn't hear the examiner quite as well as they'd like, or outages of 30 seconds, not, not three hours or, or a day. Um, so the, the hope is that for the bulk of these interruptions in connectivity, Wi-Fi, power, whatever it might be, that those can be rectified quickly. And if they can't be, the, the role of two simultaneous examiners is that if the examiner loses uh, the connection, uh, if the active examiner does, we have a second examiner who has been discreetly observing in the background and is not a distraction to the candidate, but is ready to step in as needed on, on this you know, PRM basis to fill in for the first examiner if the connection is lost. Incidentally, that's one of the functions of the navigator as well is to determine that, uh, you know, and we've even seen on this call, you know, sometimes you can't tell that you're not being heard well by the other person. And because the navigator is expected to see exactly what the candidate sees, uh, then we would anticipate that the navigator can kind of step in and say to the examiner, hey, we can't hear you very well. We're gonna switch to the secondary examiner who has been, has been there all along and is ready to step in if needed. We're going to acknowledge, I think have to acknowledge the security is less robust than it is uh, with a, an in-person model, uh, whether we're talking about computer-based exams uh, or I suppose to a lesser degree, the oral exams. Um, we're borrowing models that higher education has used for years. We're hopeful that even in this high stakes environment, we can make it work. We can make it less disruptive, uh, less intrusive, uh, otherwise be, and make sure that it doesn't interfere with the exam process because we have focused on candidate experience. What does it mean to him or her to go through this process, acknowledging that we need some level of security, getting back to that idea to make it valid. Um, and uh, we do have some very preliminary technical requirements that the candidates are gonna have to deal with, and this applies to both the um, oral exam and the computer-based exam. They're gonna have to have a broadband internet connection. They're gonna have a laptop with at least uh, about 13 inches. Uh, we're worried that a smaller screen doesn't have enough real estate to show the exam content. Uh, alternatively, of course, we could use a desktop as long as it has a webcam and a microphone. Um, and we're gonna, of course, adjust for, or allow for either Mac OS or, or Windows. Um, we're not specifically missing for this is the idea of using a tablet. And uh, there's just some technical reasons that it's more difficult to set this up with um, an iPad or a PC tablet because of what it requires and, and the assumptions that go into that IT build. Uh, and for this year, at least, we're not, uh, we're not gonna go down that road. We're gonna stick with either Mac or, or Windows in order to do this. 